to the hope and love tonight. I was just going to um, touch on a couple of points I didn't get to last week with faith. But did any of you have any particular questions? I didn't cover everything in the sheets because there's just no time. I, uh, I get the question all the time. My kids are always asking me the question. Your kids will always ask you the, uh, the question. If you don't have kids, other people's kids will ask you the question. You know, what about the people who have never heard of Jesus Christ? I mean, can they be saved? Um, I was saying last week, I, was, I wasn't saying, I was quoting scripture. Unless you were born again of water and the spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, our Lord said, uh, whoever eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. What about those who have not heard? And um, th there are... Um, you know, we're, we're given the gifts of faith, hope, and charity. And we can act against those gifts by not fully accepting them and, and relishing them and, and living with them. And some of the ways we act against them are, are listed here on the last page. Do you still happen to have the, uh, the outline on faith? If you don't have it with you, I'll just I'll mention. Um, you know, infidelity, for example, infidelity is a lack of faith in those who are not baptized. So you've probably seen in old movies reference to the infidels, right? Well, the infidels are those who do not believe and who have not been baptized. So they've never been given the gift of faith. Now, there are, there, there are different kinds of fidelity, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but, but the theologians talk about negative fidelity, and that would be on the part of those who have never heard of the faith. But the theologians also talk about positive infidelity, and positive infidelity would, would be an act committed by a person who has been given the gift of faith, but for whatever reason, and it's not a good reason, uh, refuses to accept the gift of faith. In other words, he posits an act of infidelity. He says, I am not going to accept this gift. I will not believe. Now, that's not a very good position to be in. I mean, if, if God offers you a great gift and you refuse it. So there is a problem with positive infidelity. Negative infidelity refers to those who have never heard of Jesus Christ and of um, the, the salvation which comes to us in him. But the church has never said that these people are not saved. There, uh, there is a doctrine of the church in Latin, extra ecclesiam nulla salus est. I mean, you've heard of that. Outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. No salvation outside the Catholic Church. Now, that is a teaching of the Catholic Church that we have to accept. But does that mean that those who are not Catholic will not be saved? And the answer is no, because you have to understand what the Church means by this. The Church isn't just an institution. It's just not a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. Right? The Church is fundamentally what? Family. It's a family. But, you know, I've got a family with Martha and Justin and Sophia and I'm not, I'll start naming all the kids. And all, you know, the body of Christ. The church is the body of Jesus Christ himself, right? We are, so to say, to say that there is no salvation outside the church is another way of saying that there is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. The only way in which we can be saved is by and through Jesus Christ, because he is the one who um, overcame death on Calvary, who paid the price for our sins, who entered the gates of heaven for us, so we can be saved only by Jesus Christ. But on this earth, his body is the church. Now, what of those who have not heard the message of the church? Well, who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is true man and true God. <laughs> true man and true God. Do we worship one God? 
better believe it. Yes. We worship one God, but three persons in one God. Now, did all three persons become incarnates in Jesus Christ? No, only the second person of the Trinity. So Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity incarnate. The second person of the Trinity is also known as the Logos, the Word. In other words, God the Father created everything that is through the Word, through the Logos, through um, greetings. <laughs> We're grappling here with a very deep theological uh, issue. And, and I'll, I'll recapitulate rather quickly and I won't ask the questions all over again. But we're still talking about the virtue of faith and faith is a gift given us by God. It, it, we need faith in order to be saved, but what about those who have never heard of Jesus Christ? And there is a teaching of the church uh, which runs extra ecclesium nulla salus est. Outside the church, there's no salvation. Okay, we cannot be saved outside the church. But what does that actually mean? Does that mean that those who are not Catholics cannot be saved? And the church says, no, that's not what it means. Unfortunately, there are some Catholics who think that. Uh, there are Baptists who think outside the Baptist church you can't be saved too, so you know. Uh, <clears throat> so I was trying to explain what the church really means by that. And I was saying, when the church teaches uh, outside, the Catholic, outside the Catholic Church there's no salvation, we have to see that the Catholic Church is the body of Jesus Christ. The church is the mystical body of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. So in Jesus Christ we have the meeting of heaven and earth, of time and eternity. Um, and the Logos is understood as the agency by which God created all that is. Because in Genesis, how did God create everything that is? Did he, did he snap his finger? What did he do according to scripture? He spoke. So he said, let there be light. So he, he created through the word. Okay? He created through the logos, which is the Greek for word. And it was the Logos that became incarnate in Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. That's why Jesus in the garden and many other places refers to his Father, which is the first person of the Trinity. The Logos is the creative ordering principle of everything that is. Okay? It, it is that which communicates to us everything which, which is good, which is true, which is noble, which is of God. Now, if someone has not heard of Jesus Christ, you've got a, uh, a noble pagan, and this noble pagan is searching for God and trying to live an upright and noble and decent and good life. He is searching for, reaching out for, yearning for the Logos, okay, the ordering rational principle of the universe, he is reaching out for the Logos, which we know became incarnate in Jesus Christ. So there's, there's a way, an incipient way, in which he knows Jesus Christ, but not as the Nazarene, not by name. So there's a way in which we would almost say, this man has implicit faith in Jesus, but he's never had the opportunity to encounter him. When he has the opportunity, then that faith can become explicit. Okay. But if he never has that opportunity, and it's no fault of his own, such a man or such a woman has the hope of salvation in and through Jesus Christ, because it is only through him that we are saved. Do you see how it all fits together? Did it make sense to everybody? Any questions? Yes? Baptism of desire. Yes, it's, uh, yes, the, the, uh, sometimes referred to as the baptism of desire, which was really um, first used to refer to those who were preparing for reception into the church 
at Easter time uh, during the Triduum on Holy Saturday night and they were being catechized and sometimes they would, they would die before they had the opportunity to be baptized, received into the church. And the church says that they were deprived of undergoing the physical sacrament. We, we, we need baptism in order to be saved. Unless you're born again of water and the spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. But there were things beyond their control which intervened, which kept them from the waters of baptism. But God will apply the efficacy and the power of baptism to them by their desire to receive it. So that, uh, that's right, that is called baptism by desire and is also sometimes used to apply to those good and noble pagans who are trying to find Jesus Christ but don't know him by name. Right? So that's what it really means when the church says outside the Catholic Church there's no salvation. It means outside Jesus Christ there's no salvation. Yes? Brings me to my next point. <laughs> it's always so helpful to have these plants in the audience. Though. <laughs> the, uh, that's, that's, you're asking about heretics, which I'll, I'll touch on in a minute. Um, apostasy. Apostasy is another sin against faith. And apostasy, an apostate, is someone who rejects and repudiates the Christian faith entirely rejects Jesus Christ, rejects his church, rejects the teaching of the Trinity. He's an apostate. He rejects it all. A heretic is some, and there's a way in which this can sort of be a neutral term. It kind of rings a little harsh on our ears. But a heretic is simply someone who does not accept a teaching of the church. He will accept Jesus Christ, but maybe he has... Um, a confused understanding of, of what it means to say that there, is, that there are two natures in the one person of Jesus Christ. And, and there was a heresy for a while that said, yes, there are two persons in one, or two natures in one person of Jesus Christ, but there's only one will. They were, they were called the monothelites. <laughs> But they, this, you're not going to run into too many of them. You may run into a few of them on the streets, but they won't be calling themselves monothelites lights because they won't even know what it means. But anyway, that was, it was technically a heresy because the church teaches that Jesus Christ had a human will and a divine will. So technically it was, it was a heresy. I mean, so a heresy is holding a, an erroneous doctrine as true when it isn't. Now there are different kinds of heretics. You know, there are those who will, out of malice and, and out of perhaps hatred of God, reject a teaching of the church or out of disobedience reject the teaching of the church and that individual will be what is called a formal heretic. I mean he's a full-blown honest to goodness go to hell heretic. Now I mean, well they might we can't say anybody's going to hell. We, I mean, we know some people are but we can't say which ones. Uh, but nonetheless you know you can you can wind up there and uh, and that would be that would be a formal heretic. I mean he he, he knows what the church teaches and, and he willfully and maliciously repudiates it. Now, what about these dear, sweet, good, wonderful people who are born and raised as Baptists or Presbyterians or Episcopalians? You know? And they hold to, now they, they know and love Jesus Christ. They, they follow him as their personal Lord and Savior. But they don't know that Jesus left behind a, uh, his successors, the apostles, to lead his church into all truth. So they reject uh, the papacy. Uh, they reject the successor of Peter as uh, a bulwark of, of the truth. They are heretics. I mean, they, they're, they're holding a false doctrine. They are what we call material heretics. Pardon the technical language, formal and material. But they are material heretics. That is technically they're an error, but it won't be attributed to them as guilt if they don't know any better. And that's a great consolation to me because I was raised a heretic. <laughs> and you know, it wasn't until later in life that, I mean, I always knew and loved our Lord. I mean, I, you know, I never questioned it. You know, I, mean, I remember somebody was, was witnessing to me on, a, on an airplane to Mexico 
where I'm off to tomorrow morning. And, uh, but he, he wanted, to, he said, um, when were you saved? And, and, and I said, uh, when I was baptized. Uh, and he said, when you were baptized? And I said, when I was about you know, a month old. And he said, but when did you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And I said, I've always accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Yes, but, but when did you do it? And I said, I always did it. I mean, there, there was never a time I didn't. Well, there must have been a time, he said, where you said, today I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And I said, no. I said, there wasn't a day on which I did that any more than I said, today I'm acknowledging my mother and dad as my mother and dad. I mean, they were always there. They were always my mother and dad. They always loved me. They fed me. They washed my clothes. You know, I mean, no, there wasn't a day he said, I acknowledge Frank and Tish as my personal mother and father. No, <laughs> you know, I always knew and loved them as my personal mother and father. And, and the same with Jesus Christ. I mean, I always knew him as my personal Lord and Savior. But there were a lot of things I didn't know. Uh, that, for example, that, that in the Catholic Church, he is truly present upon the altar, that, uh, that the, the Bishop of Rome, uh, in matters of faith and moral, can teach infallibly. So on a number of matters, I was in error, okay, but I didn't know any better. Uh, now, thanks be to God, I did know and love our Lord. So I did have an implicit faith, and when I was given the great ga grace to know explicitly uh, what I didn't know before, I accepted it. You know? So that's why we shouldn't be too harsh on heretics, because uh, <laughs> a lot of us have been there. And, and, uh, and, and God is calling all of us in, in, into his church. But that would, be a, that would be a distinction between a formal and, and material heretic. Did that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> well, that's all I wanted to... Uh, oh, yes, one final thing, too is uh, schism, okay, and, and this is, this isn't, a schism is not a sin against faith as such. A schism is when a, a group of believing Catholics um, will break communion with the Apostolic See, with, with Rome, with the Bishop of Rome, uh, but they will continue to believe in the power of the sacraments, in apostolic succession, in the hierarchy uh, of ministry uh, within the church, but they are no longer in obedience to the Bishop of Rome. And, and who would be the principal schismatics, if you will, in our day, those in schism? Pardon me? Probably, yeah. The the Eastern Orthodox is the big group, yeah, and, and the, um, the group following uh, uh, Marcel Lefebvre, Lefebvre, the, the Lefebvreists who have refused to accept uh, the Second uh, Vatican Council, but they, they still have bishops, they still have priests, they still have all the sacraments, but, but they're in schism. And uh, we, we, we teach that, that schism is fundamentally a sin against obedience and a sin against charity. It's not heresy. The problem is when you're in schism for a while, you usually wind up being a heretic. <laughs> um, I mean, that didn't happen to the Eastern Orthodox generally, but uh, for example, in England, for example, when Henry VIII first broke from um, obedience to Rome, um, he, he was technically in schism because he, he didn't deny the mass, the sacraments, uh, the priesthood. He was upset because the Pope would not grant him an annulment from Catherine of Aragon so he could marry Anne Boleyn so that he could have a male heir to the throne. So it wasn't, it wasn't his rejection of any teaching of the church. He needed a male heir to the throne. The Pope wasn't going to allow him to do this because he wouldn't grant a, um, an annulment. And so this is why Henry initially broke uh, from, uh, from Rome. You know, the, uh, the monarch in England is still known as the defender of the faith because Henry VIII wrote a treatise against Martin Luther uh, because Luther had denied the sacraments, a truly heretical position, and Henry wrote uh, a treatise defending uh, the seven sacraments against Martin Luther, and the Pope gave Henry VIII the title defender of the faith. Of course, then he went on to, uh, <laughs> to break his ties with Rome and, and uh, how many wives? Seven? 
I lose count sometimes. But anyway, he had, he had quite a number. But he never, he never uh, divorced any of them because divorce was not permitted by scripture. He only had, he either had the marriage annulled or he had them beheaded for treason. But he, he didn't divorce any of them because that would be uh, unscriptural. But anyway, but you, but you can, now in the case of the Anglicans, we, we can see that the, the schism eventually did lead to, uh, to heresy uh, in which they find themselves today. So th those are reflections on uh, uh, some of the implications of the great gift of faith that God has given us, one of the supernatural infused theological virtues which we cannot achieve on our own, right? It, it just comes to us as a gift. And there are two other ones, which are hope and charity. So faith, hope, and charity. And we're, we're going to talk about hope now. You've got an outline. Um, still, there's an outline here on the table if you want to look at one. Um, Now, even when, when we were talking about natural hope a while back, when we were looking at the natural moral virtues, we said that, that hope is a longing after something which is good, but it's difficult to attain this good because there are circumstances surrounding its attainment which are beyond our control. So a young student can say, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to work very hard and I hope that I get an A on my next test. It really wouldn't be right for him to say, I hope I can study hard to get an A on my next test, right? Because he can do that. I mean, that's not a circumstance out of his control. You know, I mean, he, he'd say, I will study hard and I hope that in studying hard, I can get an A on, on, on the next exam. So it always suggests something, some difficulty in attaining to the great good that, that we want. Now, the three theological virtues place us into a direct connection with, relationship with God himself, all three of these theological virtues. So God is the great hope for, uh, I'm sorry, the great good for which we hope. We have faith in things unseen. Okay? We, we hope in things unseen. We've, we know God, first of all, because we've been given the gift of faith. Okay? So we know him, we know him as the great good that we want to have at all costs, that, that no matter what, uh, we will do nothing that will place in jeopardy our uh, attaining to God this great, this great good. So. Hope is based on knowledge, that is, we have to know the good in order to hope for it. So there's a way in which it's related to the intellect. Now, I know I'm always talking about intellect. Uh, but really, this, this virtue is a perfection of the will, because it's the will that is drawn to the good. The, the intellect comes to know it, and the will is drawn to it as, as something good. The... Um, um, the, the, the intellect is sometimes referred to as the eye of the soul because it, it is able to see it. But then, then the will is, in a sense, the heart of, of the soul that then draws us uh, to that which is good. So I have here, if you would ever want to use it, a, a succinct technical definition of the theological virtue of hope with a little star beside it, asterisk E, Hope is the supernatural infused virtue by which we, relying on the omnipotence and faithfulness of God, confidently expect that God will give us eternal life and the means necessary to obtain it. Now again, it's supernatural, so it's, it's, it's a power that is given to us to enable us to live the supernatural life. Remember the, the four cardinal virtues of uh, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance are natural virtues, are powers of, of our soul, of our very being, that enable us to live the moral life here, right? It's a power. 
again, virtus means literally in Latin, power. But when we become baptized and are elevated to the realm of the supernatural, when we become incorporated into the church, which is the mystical body of Jesus Christ, and come to share his divine life, we need new powers, different powers, to lead that life, the supernatural life. And these are not powers that we can acquire because they're beyond the natural. Okay? They're supernatural powers. And the powers that God gives us to lead that life are faith, hope, and charity. Faith so, so, that, so that we can know God, and now the gift of hope so that we can long for him, reach out for him, and come finally to attain him. And you'll see in this definition, it says relying on the omnipotence and faithfulness of God. We're not relying on ourselves. You know, we can rely on ourselves to set the alarm clock for six o'clock every morning and, and to get up in a timely fashion when the alarm clock goes off. You know, we, we don't really need God's grace to pull that off. Some of our children do, maybe. <laughs> they need super, 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 supernatural power sometimes to get up when the alarm clock goes off. But no, we really shouldn't. These are natural powers that we can acquire. So we're not relying on our powers. It's, we rely on the all-powerfulness and, and the faithfulness of God himself, and we expect that God will give us eternal life and the means necessary to attain it. Because we can't attain it on our own, the only way we can attain it is by availing ourselves of the means that God gives us to get there. Okay? And, and um, what might some of those means be? that are absolutely necessary to attain eternal life. Obedience. Yeah, obedience, grace, sacraments, right. The, the sacraments are the means that we're going to, uh, that God has given us to get there, and we'll, we'll see a little bit later that, uh, and of course the sacraments are the means of grace, I mean these all fit together, but that it's, it's blasphemous presumption to think that we can attain to God by means other than those that he has given us to attain to him. So when there are some Christians that say, ha, I don't need to confess to a priest. I can go straight to God. Well, if they knew better, they would see that this is blasphemous presumption because God gave them priests as the means for the forgiveness of their sins and the reception of grace and the means of reconciliation to his body, the church. God's given us the means to attain to him. And if we think that we can get to him by means other than those which he has designated, then that's presumption, right? And, and that's, that's not a healthy situation to be in in our relationship with God. The, uh, the mode of our, of, our, of our hope is God's fidelity. Okay. Uh, we're, we know that he's true. We know that he's true to his promises. Well, I won't, I, I, well maybe I'll... See, the, Catholic, the Catholic Church teaches that we can actually merit God's reward. And we're sometimes criticized for that because we're told you know, we're totally depraved, according to classical Protestant thought. We can't do anything to save ourselves. And that um, the, um, I lost my train of thought. I just turned 60 on, on last Tuesday. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to attribute it to. The, uh, now, where was I going? Oh, Mary, thank you very much. That's all I needed. <laughs> That's all I needed. <laughs> and and that, <clears throat> that it would be sinful and presumptuous of us to claim a reward from God because we can't put God in our debt. So Catholics are criticized for holding to the teaching of merit. That is, the church says, if you do certain things, you will be rewarded. You will receive merit. You will re receive a superabundance of grace. Uh, you will receive an indulgence, your, your, the, the, the penalty due to your sins 
will, will, be, uh, will be forgiven. But you see, we, we have hope, so we have the confidence that God is going to remain faithful to his promises. It's not that we put God in our debt by saying, you know, okay, I have, I have fulfilled uh, these requirements for gaining an indulgence that the church has given us, you know, or I've gone to the sacraments and now I claim, I lay claim to, to the grace that is within these sacraments. It's not that we're being presumptuous and putting God in our debt. Rather, we are relying on the faithfulness of God to his own word. Because God said, <clears throat> you know, if you believe, you know, if you follow me, if you fight the good fight, if you run the race to the end, you will receive the reward. So God, in a sense, places himself in his own debt, if you will. And because God has made the promise, we can lay claim to it. So it's, it's not really a matter of presumption at all. It's a, matter of, it's a matter of hope. It's a matter of confidence in God's fidelity, that God is true to his word. Okay? So uh, you just have to understand these things properly. You know, because we, again, I've said many, many times, you know, we, we live in, in a culture, in a society, which is overwhelmingly Protestant. And, and so we don't even think in Catholic categories anymore. I mean, I have even heard, God forgive us all, a seminary professor say one time that the, the church no longer uh, taught indulgences, uh, which it clearly does. Um, they, well, we'll get off on that if you ever want to. But the, but the, the point is, even, even within, with the teaching on indulgences, it's an expression of our confidence in God and his promises and that he remains true to what he has promised us uh, in his word. Okay? So, uh, as I say, we, we have to be careful. We don't allow ourselves to be shaped by, uh, if you will, by, by alien ways of thinking about our relationship with God. So the motive of our hope is God's faithfulness. And the primary object of our hope is God himself. But this is kind of neat <laughs> because the secondary object of our hope is everything that's good. It's, it's the glory of our resurrected bodies and the resurrected bodies of our family members and our friends. And indeed, every spiritual and temporal good is also secondarily an object of the virtue of hope. Okay? I mean, you, can, you can just see how, how full and rich and, and ample and, and elevating the, this, this gift is from God, this, this virtue is, that we, that, we can, that we hope for all spiritual and temporal goods. We have to remember, too, that when, uh, remember, when the end comes, it, it's, God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Okay? I mean, all things, all things will, be, will be recreated. You know, we, we don't become flittering spirits in, in, uh, in, in, in the sky someplace. You know, we're, we're going to be bodies. I mean, so much so that, 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 that uh, our Lord said to the doubting Thomas, you know, come on, you know, put your finger in my nail prints, you know, and put your hand here on my side, you know, don't doubt. I mean, it's me, Jesus, you know, <laughs> in the flesh, because we believe in the resurrection of the body, okay? And, and that is also uh, an appropriate object of our hope. The, um, now, this, look at H here in the outline, and this is, this is important too. We're going to talk about acts of hope. Remember we said that we, that we gain the moral virtues by doing good deeds over and over, and then they become second nature to us. But remember, we, we can't get the theological virtues or the supernatural virtues that way because they're not natural. They're only gifts. So how do we increase the theological virtues in us. You know, if I want to build up my strength, I, st I start doing more push-ups every morning, right? And maybe I increase them by 10 every week, you know, until I'm up to 70 a, a day, you know? And uh, so I, I build, you know? But the supernatural virtues aren't like that. I cannot acquire them. So how do I get more? Because I want more, right? I, I want more of God's grace. I want more of God's gifts. I want more of his virtues. The only way we can 
obtain an increase in these gifts is by opening ourselves up to them, by disposing ourselves to them. And, and the, the greatest and the most fundamental way of doing that is, is through the sacraments, where we receive the sacraments and this infusion of God's grace. And with God's grace comes all the gifts. Come, they come the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and every other gift that he has to offer us. So we have to be open to them, dispose ourselves to them, to realize this increase. But it's, it's not just through the, the sacraments. I mean, that's the... That, the chief and fundamental way and the objective way in which we can receive this increase. But through something called sacramentals, like using holy water to bless ourselves when we leave the house in the morning or we go into a church. Uh, I hope you all have the holy water stoops by your front door when you leave the house. If you don't, see me. I'll see if I can't find some for you. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's a wonderful pious practice as we go out into the world. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a way of, of remitting venial sin, too, by the way, to bless yourself with holy water. So it's, you know, it's no small thing. I mean, it, now see, that's the other thing. You know, I mean, maybe Protestants would go so far as to say, well, it's nice that you, that, that you remind yourself of your baptism when you cross yourself with holy water, and, and it's, a, it's a nice motivational exercise. But see, with us, things actually happen. You know, they're not just motivational exercises. We bless ourselves with holy water, and not only are we reminded of our baptism and motivated to be good and faithful soldiers of Christ, but venial sin is remitted. It's cleansed, washed away. It's powerful stuff, that holy water. Do you, they, still, they have in the tanks in the back of the church. It doesn't cost anything. You, you know, fill up the milk jug, take it home. You know, I would, we, would, we would sprinkle our kids when they would go to sleep at night, you know, or sometimes uh, take a little bowl with our fingers and we'd... we'd dip our fingers in the holy water and hold them out to the kids, and the kids would then touch their fingers, our fingers, and cross themselves. But I remember we, they had friends over one time, and I was going, well, I mean, I startled one terribly one night when I was sprinkling them, you know, I mean, he, <laughs> he jumped out of that. So I thought, well, next time I better be a little more discreet about this, you know. So, so I had the holy water in a bowl, and I was going through, and I, I dipped my fingers in the, in the holy water, and I held them out, and, and you know, you touch your fingers in the holy water and bless yourself. So I dipped my fingers in, I held my hand out, and he shook my hand, you know, didn't quite get it. But we're, we're trying to uh, spread Catholic piety and practices in these ways. But, you know, holy water is good stuff. I mean, there's lots of good stuff out there that, we, that we've gotten we can use, okay? Um, but when we do these things, we open ourselves to the increase. Like, we want to increase faith in ourselves. It's nothing that, 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 that we do which directly affects it, but it makes it possible so that we can offer up aspirations like, O um, oh Lord, help thou my unbelief. You know, Jesus, I believe in you, help me believe in you more. Or Jesus, I love you, help me to love you more. Those are, those are aspirations which open us to an increase uh, in these virtues, which I said last week, as the theologians say, they are in nobis sine nobis. They are in us, but not of us. Okay, the, the, these, are, these are gifts they're in us without us, basically, is what technically what, what it means in the Latin. And actually, um, I have here by H. Gaudium et Space. Gaudium et Space, anybody offhand know what that refers to? Uh, well, it's not encyclical, but I'm glad you recognize it as a church document. But it's one what, of the constitutions that's right. It's the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world. Gaudium et Space. And it means joy and hope. It is a beautiful beginning to this uh, document of the Second Vatican Council, which is saying to the church, be open to and embrace the world and transform it, okay, with joy and hope. I mean, these, these ought to be uh, our characteristics as, as Catholic Christians. Now, there are some errors concerning this virtue. One goes by the technical term disinterestedness, disinterestedness. Again, this is a dangerous one in, in contemporary culture where everybody thinks if there is a God, he's just Mr. Nice Guy. Um, I have a friend that just celebrated his, his 70th birthday. He's 10 years older than I. And he wrote me an email and we're really good friends. No one for many, many years. And, and, and he said, you know, I, I'm, I'm uncertain and a little scared about death. 
And I wrote back and I said, well, you don't have to be uncertain. You're going to die. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's it. And my wife said, that wasn't the most sensitive thing you could have said to me. You know, I mean, but, but I mean, I, would, I, said, I said, you know, there's no uncertainty there. But, but I said, uh, you know, the other we can address, you know, I mean, uh, we, we can prepare to, to live our final days uh, in peace and joy with God so that we reach the point where we're looking forward uh, to, to, uh, to seeing him face to face and being with him so that we're, we really reach the point where, we, where we're anticipating it, you know, with, with faith, hope, and love. And uh, he wrote back and said, uh, yeah, I know, but I mean, God's one tough hombre. <laughs> I said, yeah, he's a tough hombre, but remember, he's the forgiving father, you know. Uh, but we, we have to work on these, on these virtues. But uh, this was a guy that was, did not suffer from disinterestedness. In other words, he didn't think that God will save us no matter what. But you're, I would say your average American quasi-Christian thinks that, you know. Which, okay, God loves us. I mean, God wouldn't, you know. I mean, God wouldn't reject. Well, remember, as Father Romanus was saying yesterday, God doesn't reject us. I mean, when we sin, we bring penalties, we, we bring difficulties, we, we bring hardships upon ourselves. It's not that God wants these for us. I mean, that, that we're choosing them for ourselves, okay? So that, um, uh, to quote St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Contra Gentilis, that God is offended by us only when we act against our own good, which means we must act for our good if we're truly going to flourish and we're truly going to be saved. So it's not a matter of disinterestedness. Um, another thing we hear, and I hear it a lot, is, well, it, it's selfish and inappropriate to love God because we desire heaven or we fear hell. The only motivation for love of God simply ought to be love of God. Well, I mean, there, there, there's some truth to that, but the, but the real matter is we ought to be desiring heaven because that is where we will live out our love with God. And we ought to fear hell because hell is the absence of God's loving presence and our being in his presence. Okay. So it's okay, it's all right to desire heaven and fear hell. Okay, so don't worry about that. I mean, that's, 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 that's a legitimate expression of the theological virtue of hope. Um, now, some of the consequences of this virtue for the Christian's life. I mean, we're given this gift. What happens as a result of this gift? Well, one of the things we do, as I've already said, is that we make acts of hope. And one of the ways in which we really build up in ourselves hope. Or, no, I, I said that wrong, didn't I? I said, what did I say? It's one of the ways we build up in ourselves the gift of hope. One of the ways in which we allow God to build up in us the gift of hope, <laughs> because it's his gift and we allow him to build it up in us, for example, is to meditate on the four last things, okay, death, judgment, heaven, or hell. Right? We should think about those things. You know, in, in the Middle Ages, people would go through an exercise, exercise called the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. And they would pick a day and, and they would say, um, Okay, I'm, I'm giving myself a month to live. And in that month, they would do penance for their sins, they would pay off their debts, they would make reparations for evils that they had done, they would clean out the garage. <laughs> I mean, do whatever was necessary to make things that make sure. They, they would become reconciled with, with uh, people with whom they had had misunderstandings, uh, and, and they would prepare to die and to, 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 to go meet God. And if they were still alive at the end of the month, so they were in much better shape than they were at the beginning of the month, and they would go on in better shape than they were before. You know, it was a regular exercise called the art of dying, you know, and, and, and they would practice it. And, uh, and Catholics uh, still have the, the wonderful practice of, of praying to St. Joseph for a holy death, because uh, tradition has it that, that he, he died the most happy and holy death because he had his son and the blessed mother at his, uh, his adopted son and his, the blessed mother at his side as he died. I mean, who could hope for a happier death? So uh, St. Joseph is the patron of a happy death and, and we ought to pray to him that, that, that we uh, are, are able to leave this life as, as happily as he did in the presence of the blessed mother and our savior. But that's not gonna happen unless we think about these things. We usually we don't like to think about these things. Um, there, there's a, 
how many of you know the, the expression Dies Irae? Day of wrath or day of judgment. Yes, it's a marvelous. It was, it was a, a, a long hymn that was always sung in the, at funeral masses, requiem masses. Day of wrath or day of judgment. It, it, uh, heaven and earth shall pass away. And it's, it's, it's beautiful but terrifying at the same time him and um, they've taken it out. I mean, it's, it's no longer required part of the, of the funeral mass, but I want it in mind. I've already let that be known. Uh, because it, it, it talks about judgment, but, 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 it, but in talking about judgment, it talks about Jesus Christ being our advocate who goes before God's judgment throne. It's a beautiful hymn, obviously you know it. And, uh, the, uh, um, Oh, which which uh, you find there are, there are marvelous uh, renderings of this in in the great requiems and Verdi's requiem, the the, the Dies Irae is just oh, not even powerful as can be, and Tuba Mirum, this part of it, the trumpets where the trumpets shall sound, the trumpets of heaven, you know, when when they come to announce the final end, when when uh, Verdi's uh, requiem was first performed, there there were there were four choirs positioned in different parts of the cathedral, it was sound around. I mean, they had brass ensembles up in these choir lofts and so forth. And, and uh, the, the Dies Irae just, I guess, you know, as it began, just had the windows of the cathedral shaking. And, and the tuba mirum, when the trumpet shall sound, the, the lead soprano just collapsed in a nervous attack. She was overcome with emotion at this, at this great music. So if you haven't, that'd be a, that'd be a nice thing, you know, get a requiem. Get, you've got, you've got, we have a, a week and a half left, roughly, of uh, of Lent, get a requiem, Ver, one, Verdi's requiem, um, one of Mozart's requiems, I mean, there are just endless ones out there, and, and listen to the music, read the words, and, and meditate on, uh, on your own requiem mass. I mean, that will be a... John, I wanted to ask you, is there any book that can prepare a person for dying, like say somebody in hospitals? I go to the hospital a couple times like, for 10 years, hmm. and it's like unbelievable. People start doing, you know, like say you're in the hospital for a few weeks, they don't feel like God's abandoned them. Mm, yeah. And it's really a problem. And uh, you wouldn't believe what, what I see of it. It's absolutely unbelievable. Well, they, they do have books uh, that, uh, you know, the Holy Father wrote an encyclical on suffering. And uh, that's a beautiful thing, just to get people uh, to read, to, to show them what they can do with their suffering. That it, this isn't something. It's wasted, you know. I mean, the, what they're going through, they, they can actually use this as a powerful prayer to achieve great good. The biggest problem with people suffering in hospitals is that, is that they, they, they feel um, non-productive and, and powerless. And, and if, if they can find a way to see that, that in uniting their sufferings with those of Christ, that they become powerful beyond words and, and, and can begin to affect great good in the world through their sufferings. Yeah, but there's some good stuff. I'll, I'll see if I can get you some. The, um, also, um, another consequence of this virtue is to work for a better world because the possession of God is not just an individual affair, but actually uh, uh, something which is, uh, we're all to enjoy together. And I've already talked about availing ourselves of the means of salvation of the sacraments. I'll touch briefly and we'll end, end this first hour with sins against hope. Uh, in other words, how, how do we repudiate this gift that's given us uh, to our own detriment? And um, there are those who hate God, that, that, that reject him um, and, and don't see him as their great good. Obviously, this is a terrible sin against this gift. Um, another one is despair, but this is, I mean, you've just brought this up, this is a dangerous one because um, True despair results from a voluntary uh, lack of confidence in God uh, of, etern of attaining eternal salvation. One, one gives up any hope of being saved, and, and again, this is very crippling. But very often, this, this isn't willful. In other words, you know, when, when somebody's sick and they feel, they feel um, forsaken and deserted, the, the despair begins to set in, and, and this is an emotional, not, not an intellectual uh, response. And, and we have to help them over that. But it's, it, 
they start, it gets, it's a very dangerous thing, as you've seen, when, when people slip into despair. It's incredible. Yeah, it's very dangerous. And, uh, but you have to be able to make a distinction between what's happening to them emotionally and when what they're able to grasp with their intellect in, in terms of hoping uh, in what God uh, wills for them, which is, which is their great good. Uh, I've already talked about presumption as a sin against hope. The Pelagian presumption, anybody happen to know who Pelagius was? An Irish monk, and he was a heretic, and his principal heresy was. It, it, <laughs> there are too many heresies out there, gang. Was it that we can uh, work for our own salvation? Uh, we don't need grace, or we can work out our salvation. Ourselves. Yeah, I mean, th through sufficient effort, we can attain our own salvation. Um, not easily. I mean, Pelagius was a tough monk, uh, heavy mortifications, but. Uh, he believes that with enough effort we, we could attain to our salvation. So this is presumption against the gifts of God. The Lutheran presumption is like almost the opposite, and, and that is that we, we can do nothing to contribute to our salvation. Okay. The, the, uh, I remember an example, I, was, I don't remember where I read this, a long time ago. There was a debate between a Dominican priest and a Lutheran, and um, the Lutherans said, remember, we are justified by grace through faith. We're justified by faith through grace alone. Um, we're totally depraved. There is no health in us. We can do nothing. We, we, we can't gain merit in the eyes of God. And um, the, um, the Lutheran said to the Dominican, he said, he, he said um, uh, our understanding of being saved by God is that we're standing in the elevator, it's a Lutheran understanding, and all of a sudden the elevator goes up and takes us to the higher floor. Um, you Catholics think you've got to walk in and push the button. Well, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> and, and then he, he used another metaphor where, where he, said, uh, the, uh, he said, I think the Lutheran understanding of, uh, of being saved is the, the mother cat who picks up her kitten by the scruff of its neck and picks it up from one spot and carries it over and drops it down another spot. And, and he said to the Dominican, I get the idea that your idea of salvation is more like the baby monkey, where the baby monkey cannot get from one tree to the other without the mother. The mother gets the baby monkey there, but the baby monkey clings to the, to the uh, chest of the mother as, as the mother, swings the next tree, and the, the Dominican says, yeah, I'll agree with that, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, the, the Lutheran thought he was being critical of the, of the, the Catholic approach, but the Catholic approach says, no, there's some substance to that, because we, we have to avail ourselves of the means of salvation. We, only God can save us, we're only saved through the means of salvation, but we have to at least avail ourselves of, of the means of salvation. So that would be uh, Lutheran uh, presumption. Um, again, blasphemous presumption, as I said before, would be thinking that, that God would save us without our availing ourselves of the means that he's given us. Um, <coughs> expecting too much from God, uh, it, can, it can be a sin against hope. I mean, the one thing, remember Jesus uh, said, you know, if you follow me, you will, have, you will have brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers galore. Remember, he said, you have the biggest family you could ever, ever dream of, and persecution besides. <laughs> you know? So I mean, the one thing he promised us was persecution. So if we get through life, it's one of the, we're so, I'd be so grateful for being Catholics because we're constantly being persecuted by somebody or other, uh, which I think is a sign of the fact that we're the true church. But, um, and another uh, presumptuous sin against hope is, this happens, Committing a sin, anticipating that we'll be forgiven. So you're tempted. Oh, should I? No, really, should, no, I shouldn't have another drink. Well, yeah, maybe I'm on the edge. Well, if I have another drink, it's only, you know, I haven't, I haven't been out for so long. And these are my, and before long, you, you think, yeah, well, you know, if, I, if I have too much, I can always go to confession. Okay? Bad motivation. <laughs> you know? and if, in fact, if you do that and you go to confession, you have to confess that. I mean, you have to confess the fact that, that you went ahead and sinned anyway because you figured you'd be able to get forgiven for it. That's another sin, okay? Um, but we may, we may always hope for God's mercy. In fact, must always hope for God's mercy and will never be disappointed. 
but we may never presume upon it. And, and this is why I've always, I'm, I, I wasn't with Mother Teresa when she died, but I don't, I, I'm absolutely certain that when she threw herself upon the mercy of Jesus Christ at, at her death, because we're all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we can fully expect God's mercy, but we can never presume upon it. Well, that's a quick overview of the virtue of hope. Uh, any questions on, yes? Yeah. Is it the case that when we're speaking about the theological virtue of hope, that really there's only one hope that is infallible, and that is eternal life and the means related to it? Correct. Uh, what if I, can, I cannot have an infallible hope of my child's salvation. No, or, unfortunately. Okay, so any, there may be good and bad hopes, but if they're not about eternal life specifically, they're not related, they're not infallible. Correct. According to so, I mean, I can. I mean, the other promises of God, like ask what you want, you shall receive. You know, and well, you're hoping in God's promise, but it turns out it's a false hope. Well, the, <laughs> you know, the, uh, there's the Latin phrase here, "Ave crux space unica," hail O cross, our only hope. You know, and the, the only that that is the only hope right there, and. Um, and, and we have to be ready to embrace it, you know, for, for the glory that lies beyond. And Thomas, has, he, he said, one in his Summa Theologica, or Summa Theologiae, how you pronounce it, um, says there's, there's a prayer that God will always answer. He will always answer. Uh, and it is, Thomas always had conditions, a prayer for ourselves, surprisingly enough, um, a prayer for God's grace in order for us to be saved, and a prayer for the means to avoid the, uh, the sins which would separate us from God and his love. And that's like you were saying earlier, we can't even hope for our children. I mean, each of us finally, we're only saved in the body, in the body of Jesus Christ and with others. But each of us finally has to answer uh, for ourselves before God's throne. But if we pray for those things, St. Thomas says that prayer will be answered. David? And I think you can relate to material hopes. You know, when we're looking at Bible universities, then you can relate that to the eternal hope. If it's for your good and tends toward your salvation, you'll get it. If it's not, you won't. That's right. God's infinite wisdom knows what's good for you and what's not. So, you know, if you don't get, you know, the, the red ring of the rifle for Christmas, it's not because God's not listening or. Exactly. The the um, um, oh, you're you're absolutely right. I just the the, um, the 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 stories told of the the young man that that uh, went to a Franciscan priest and and uh, asked the Franciscan if if he would offer up a novena for him, and the Franciscan said, uh, "Well, of course, my son. What's it for?" And he said, "I'd love to have a Lexus." And the Franciscan says, well, what's a Lexus? And, and the young man says, it's this magnificent sports car. It has, you know, it's got a powerful engine and, and these racing wheels. And the, this humble Franciscan said, I can't offer Navina for something like that. You know, and this might impair your salvation. I, I couldn't do it. So uh, undeterred, the man went and found a Dominican. And he said, Father, he said, would you offer Navina for me? And the Dominican said, I'd be happy to offer Navina. What is it, my son? What, what would you like the Navina offered for? And he said, well, Father, I'd love to have a Lexus. And the Dominican said, oh, what's a Lexus? And the, and the young man said, oh, it's, just, it's the newest of sports cars, and it's fantastic. It's a beautifully performing machine. And, and the good Dominican said, oh, I, I couldn't possibly do a Navina for something like that. Well, this young man was totally undeterred. And uh, he found a Jesuit, one of the Jesuits said, <laughs> he said, Father, Father, he said, would you please offer a novena for me for Alexis? And the Jesuit looked at him and said, what's a novena? <laughs> no. So I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> right in the shadow of St. Joseph, Stephen, I, I had to do that. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but yeah, we have to be careful what, what we ask for. But you're right. If it leads to our eternal salvation, God will grant it. And if, if it doesn't, uh, we won't. Did I tell you the story about when, when I was studying in, in Fribourg and the, the, the Cistercian monks? in Otrive. Did I tell you about that? 
I mean, this, this, this is the supernatural outlook, though, and the supernatural virtue of hope that we're talking about. Um, I mean, it's, it's nice that the material things come along. As, as I was saying earlier, we can hope for all temporal goods as, as well. But this is a true story. I was, there was a Cistercian monastery outside Fribourg where I was studying, and, and they, they lived a very, very austere, rigorous life. I mean, this is a very true story. And they wore their habits all the time. They had the severe tonsure, you know, their heads were shaved, just the ring of hair around, around their heads. And uh, um, got up at 4.30 in the morning to sing matins, and uh, everything was still in Latin. It was an incredibly rigorous life. And I, I, I became good friends with one of the young monks then. We were both young then, Pater Albrecht. And uh, we actually named our second son Matthew for him. He's Matthew Albrecht, if you can believe it. But anyway, the... Um, he was studying at the university with me, and uh, I was in Fribourg at the time of the fall of Saigon uh, during the Vietnam War. And the communists, as you know, just overran uh, South Vietnam, and, and there, there were terrible persecutions and martyrdoms. <clears throat> and there were a lot of Vietnamese monks at this monastery. And, and I said to Father Albrecht, I said, Golly, I, I guess now that Saigon has fallen, um, all those Vietnamese monks will have to go back to Vietnam. Or, I mean, I, all those Vietnamese monks will have to stay here in Switzerland. And he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, they'll, they'll go back to Vietnam. And I said, but Father, it's going to be so dangerous now that the communists have taken over the country for them to go, go back there. Oh, no, no. He said, it's far more dangerous for them here. I said, Switzerland? I said, what are you talking about? How could it be more dangerous? for the Vietnamese monks here when their country's been taken over by the communists. And he put out his, his arm and he stopped me and he said, look. And he pointed across the street to a department store with, with a big uh, showcase window and, and there was a very scantily clad female mannequin in, standing there with a, with a bikini on, you know. And, and he pointed to a movie marquee, a movie theater right beside it with not the most edifying movie showing. And he pointed to that and he said, it's going to be far more dangerous for them here. And I thought, whoa. I mean, I was thinking on the earthly plane. He was thinking on the supernatural plane and, and their vocation as monks, you know. And um, years later, I was, I was in Switzerland with our Matthew, and I, I found him. I looked him up. He was a chaplain of a convent of contemplative Cistercian nuns. And we had lunch together. And, and I said, Father, I said, whatever happened to those Vietnamese monks that were at Otrive? Uh, he said, they went back to Vietnam. And he said, we were blessed with martyrs. So, I mean, that's, that's the supernatural outlook, you know, the, that we have to work for. But, uh, but now we've got some coffee in the club room. And, uh, Okay, we're going to look at the theological virtue of hope. Um, I, I, you know, I would love to have done this and, and just only used Pieper's works because uh, I, I used his uh, book on the four cardinal virtues, but he did write uh, a book on each of the theological virtues as a philosopher. But he, um, it took him a whole lifetime to, to, to write about all the virtues. The, first one he wrote about was, does anybody remember, Fortitude. That was the first uh, essay that he wrote on the virtues. And then he was retired and, and probably in his 80s or so when, maybe, I don't know, I'd have to check the exact time. But anyway, he, he was at the end of his teaching career when he, when he wrote uh, his book on love. And it's just called About Love, Uwe de Liebe. But... Um, I interviewed him at the end of his life. Uh, he was 93, when, and I, I got a grant. I went to Germany, and, and uh, I have seven hours of interviews with Joseph Pieper and his daughter, who was a physician and a, a sculptress who had done a bronze of him, and, and, uh, and I, I, I still have them. I'd like to maybe someday make a, 
a documentary of him, if I can ever find the money <laughs> at the time. But anyway, I, I, I have high quality television uh, videotapes of Joseph Pieper, and we were, we were talking about the, um, uh, his writings, and he was saying that it took him a whole lifetime to write on the virtues, and he said love was the last one, and he had, he had scheduled a seminar with, uh, uh, with the students at the university, and when they gathered, um, they were talking about the subject matter, and there was a young man in the class that said, I'd really like you to lecture on something else. And Pieper said, but I've planned this, this course already. Uh, what did you have in mind? And the young man said, I'd like you to lecture on love. And Pieper said, but, but really, I, the, the course is already prepared. I, I don't have a course prepared to lecture about love. And uh, the student said, well, I'd really like to have it. Maybe we could take a vote. So Pieper said, well, very well. Um, Let's take a vote. And he said, the whole class said they wanted him to do this seminar on love. And it was that seminar that, that developed into his book about love. And uh, he said to me, and you know, he said, I never saw that young man again. He said, he never came back. And I said, do you think perhaps he was a messenger? And people went, which is about as much as a German will say. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, Germans are about something like that. They're very discreet, you know. Um, and Pieper was a Westphalian, and they're they're really uh, uh, low-tempered, you know, even-tempered. <laughs> but um, so keep that. If you ever read his book, you should just remember that little anecdote. I mean, I happen to believe that, that it probably was an angel that led. To, he would never go so far as to say that, but that lead him to, to write that final uh, work. And it, in a sense, it would be kind of a, appropriate that the, the crowning um, literary piece of, of his career would be on love, because this is more than just the, the crowning of all the virtues. It's the life of all the virtues. I mean, it, it in it itself infuses and makes all the virtues what they are. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians, so faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And, and the love does abide because um, obviously faith and hope disappear once we're in heaven, right? Because we, there's nothing more to hope for. <laughs> we've already attained it, and we don't have to have faith in God because we possess God fully, but what will remain uh, is love. And this, too, is an infused supernatural virtue. It's a, it's a power, a gift that's poured into us, infused. And um, we read in Romans, for God's love has been poured into our hearts. See, the theologians don't make up these terms like infused virtue. I mean, they, they're really drawn from Scripture. Um, it has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit uh, who has been given to us. The Latin, of course, for love is caritas, from which we derive charity. And caritas itself is derived from caros, meaning dear or beloved. So, you know, we have this beautiful picture of uh, the beloved disciple, you know, reclining on the breast of Jesus at, uh, at the Last Supper. And so intimate in, in his relationship with our Lord. If any of you have seen the Passion, it's, it's John that is there with the Blessed Mother but so moved by what's occurring, he's speechless. I mean, I, I think he hardly utters a word in, in the film. And, uh, but he was the one that was closest and, and dearest to Jesus and uh, was the beloved disciple. And it's, it's the, uh, derived from the root word for this virtue itself, charis. And as I say, it, it when I say it informs, it doesn't mean like, you know, inform really means, we think of, you give somebody information, but the idea is the information is taken within us and forms us. I mean, it's not just a, a passive reception of information. I mean, the, the, the real meaning of inform is, is to shape interiorly by taking more knowledge within yourself. Okay, so love informs shapes 
and vivifies all the other virtues, vivifies from, from life. I mean, it makes them alive. I mean, without, without love, we are as clanging symbols, as, as Paul says. We're nothing. We can give our bodies to be burned. We can give everything. He, he said we can give everything away in, to charity, but without love, in other words, you can give the stuff away, but if it's not being given away out of love, it's, it's worthless. It's, it's of no, no good, no use. Um, there's a wonderful image that uh, St. Jose Maria Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei, uses where he says, you know, without grace, and that's what this virtue, this is what love is, caritas is, it's, it's the very grace and love of God. But he said, if, if we do good deeds, without grace, without love, he said, it's like a seamstress uh, sitting at her table with her needle, hemming, uh, sewing a hem in a skirt, okay, and, and spending, you know, hours doing this, but there's no thread in the needle. <laughs> so it doesn't do anything, you know. I mean, in a sense, this is what good works without charity are, they're, they're worthless. I mean, they, they, this is why we, we, we have to do everything in our power to, 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 to be in grace, to be in love uh, with God as, as we do the good things that God gives us to do. Technical definition here with your little asterisk, a supernatural infused virtue by which we are inclined to love God above all things because of himself, and our neighbors and ourselves because of God. So God is goodness, truth, and beauty. I mean, he, he's, he's everything for which the human heart could ever aspire. Uh, Gustave Thibon, a Frenchman, said this as only a Frenchman could. Uh, he said, woman offers man what God alone can give. I mean, now, you know, a, a man falls in love with a woman, He's drawn outside himself. Uh, he, he, he's, he's ready to sacrifice everything for her, uh, even to give up his life for the beloved. Uh, but even this great love, which, which we experience on, on this earth, um, is, is but a promise of, of what God ultimately wants to give us. There's only, only a Frenchman could come up with an <laughs> image for love of God like that. that uh, a uh, woman offers man what God alone can give. Now, God does give us, if we're spouses, uh, the, his love through our spouse. But ultimately, this, this love is realized fully in him. And this, this is why, I mean, in, in Christian marriage, too, we, we, we could not love our spouses near so well did we not love God more. Okay? Because that cements the love that, that we have for our spouses. I mean, it, it, it makes the love that we have for our spouses, you know, absolutely indissoluble so that nothing uh, can separate us from our spouse, you know, any more than anything can separate us from the love of God. So the um, a moral theologian German by the name of Peschke uh, defines this virtue as the joyful, dedicated approval of everything God is and wills. If it's, if it's God, if it's of God, we love it. Even the cross. We even love the cross. We embrace the cross. If it's, if it's what God wills. Now, it's funny. I was recently in, in, in Rome and a, a book by the name of... Uh, Eros and Agape came up, and it was written by a Swedish Lutheran, finally, bishop by the name of Nigren. Are you familiar with that work, Eros? Agape and Eros? Well, it, it sort of makes the case, it was like I was saying before, the only reason we ought to, uh, uh, um, we ought to hope in God, just not out of a desire for heaven and fear of hell, but just because of God. And I said, no, it's all right to desire heaven and to fear hell. And we do so because of, of our love of God. But there are those that, that would say the only kind of love which we can have is, is this purely unselfish love, which is agape. Uh, it, it, and Nigren uh, presents a juxtaposition between 
what he calls human love, which he dubs eros, and the, uh, the love of, of God, which is agape. And it's the love which, which seeks no reward, uh, which wants nothing for itself. Well, our tradition is, is a little more understanding of what the human condition is, and talks about two aspects of love, both eros and agape, or in, in the more technical Latin terminology, amor concupiscentiae and amor benevolentiae, the, the love of concupiscence and the love of benevolence. But we say it's all right to have, not only is it all right, we, we can't love properly unless we have both. So, and, and I just bring these out to say they're legitimate. There's nothing to be upset or worried about. But the, um, you know, when you really love somebody and you spend time with them, you feel good, right? I mean, you, you want to spend time with them because you, you, you enjoy their company and you're, it's pleasurable to be with them. And this is what is referred to um, in the tradition by a more concupiscentiae or sometimes selfish love. But this is desiring the possession and the enjoyment of the beloved. And we would say, that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. You know? But there's, a, there's another side to this love, and they're inseparable. And that's, that's the selfless, disinterested element. And this is where we desire only the good of the beloved. In other words, it's not a self-seeking love. We don't want to get something from the beloved. It, it, in fact, it's, it's, only in, it's only as we have this disinterested love for the beloved, and, and we want only what is good for the beloved, and we see the beloved enjoying it, that we're then able to, to enjoy this amor concupiscentiae, that we, that, we, that we relish the joy that the beloved is having, it, it, the beloved uh, is, is um, enjoying. So um, I just point out that there, there's, there's nothing wrong with both of these elements, and, and uh, uh, sometimes certain elements within the Protestant tradition you know, I mentioned the other day that Puritanism is sometimes defined as the uneasy feeling that somebody somewhere might be enjoying himself. Uh, it's all right, we're supposed to enjoy ourselves, you know. The, uh, e even in, uh, in, in, in our selfless love uh, for others. The theological virtue consists in a will to serve God and to wish Him well. I mean, it's, it's simple, flat out rejoicing in the goodness of God and a desire for the increase of his glory. Now, if we pray in the Lord's Prayer, um, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, which means what? You know, may, may your name be holy. But how, do, how dare we or can we say to God, who is all holy, you know, may your name be holy? I mean, what does that mean? I mean, how can... How can the holiness of God's name become more holy by our sort of wishing it, the prayer for God, you know. What we're praying for there is that more and more and more people will come to know and see and recognize the goodness and the beauty of God and, and the holiness of his name. Okay. That's what, when we say, hallowed be thy name, we can't be so presumptuous as to say, Golly, may your name be holy. It is holy, you know. But what we want, what we're saying in that prayer is may more and more and more hearts be opened to the glory of your name and, and the, the beauty of you, okay? And, um, and so this gift is given to us so that we can love God as fully as, we, as, as is humanly possible. And the primary object of our love, obviously, is God himself. But the secondary object of our love is any potential friend of God. So we're, we're, we're to love everybody, even, even heretics, <laughs> even sinners, uh, because while I was yet a sinner, God loved me. And so we're to love everybody as a potential friend of God. But we are not to love, and this is just an aside, we're, we're not to love those who are not friends of God and cannot be friends of God. Who cannot be friends with God? Hmm? 
No, no, they got the potential, they got the potential. <laughs> but there are some for whom the potential's gone. They can't, they can't become friends of God. Who, who are they? The fallen angels. The fallen angels. Yeah, I mean, uh, Satan, Satan and his legions. And um, they're gone, there's no, there's no hope for them. Uh, so we can't, don't try to be friends with a, with a fallen angel. <laughs> It's, you'll lose. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's bad news. The, um, but anybody else, you know, we, we're to love as, as, a, as a potential friend of God. St. Teresa of Lisieux, uh, in, in her convent, um, read a, an account in the newspaper in the recreation room of the convent of a terrible murderer who had uh, butchered a family. And um, when... As soon as she learned of it and he was apprehended, she began praying for his conversion as a potential friend of God. And uh, it was a very notorious uh, trial that took place. Again, a lot of coverage in the newspapers. And the man never showed any remorse whatsoever uh, for his sin. And St. Therese of Lisieux, nonetheless, prayed for him day in and day out, and day in and day out as a uh, potential friend of God. And um, by all accounts, no sign of remorse, no sign of, of, of penance and, uh, or repentance. And she was quite despondent over this because she felt her, her prayer had failed. And um, the day of his execution, she went to the newspaper to read uh, the account of it with a very heavy heart, despondent. And as she was reading the newspaper and came to this passage, her heart just leapt for joy because the, uh, as the man was about to be executed, uh, he, uh, and a priest obviously had, had gone with him, but again, he was showing no signs of, of remorse that uh, he, he broke away from his guards, went over to the priest, fell on his knees, kissed the crucifix, and asked the priest for forgiveness. And her heart just leapt with joy because she knew that, that the man left this life as a friend of God, you know. I love that story because she didn't, you know, she didn't give up. And, and he, you know, he was not the sort of man you'd, you'd want to love and, and say prayers for either because of the, the, uh, the heinous character of, of, his, of his crime. Um, the, the, the motive uh, for this virtue that leads us to love God is any attribute of God because any attribute of God is... is is all perfect and all good, and, and so will lead us uh, to love him and, and to anticipate and look for uh, the, uh, the joys of the beatific vision. Now, the thing that, again, we've got to say to, in, in the world in which we live is that as we understand these matters, love is fundamentally a matter of the will, not the emotions. That Love is willing the good of the other. And you say, we'll see that this is very important because one of the consequences of this gift is that we are to love everybody. Everybody is a potential friend of God. But there's no requirement that we have to like them. Okay. I mean, you know, we, we sometimes confuse love and like. And, uh, but the loving is a matter of the will, not of the emotions, not of, the, of taste, you know, of sentiment, but desiring the good for the other person. And, and that helps us get through a lot of, of, of difficult times in our relationships with other, with other people. Um, the, um, I said before that, that the theological virtues aren't like the moral virtues, uh, which are, constitute a means, a mean between two extremes, but there are, there is no mean for any of the theological virtues. As St. Bernard said, the measure of the love of God is to love him without measure. And, uh, and in the relationship we have with God, we are to love him without measure, and everything we do is to be a life of prayer and, and contemplation of the highest priority. You know, St. Paul said, pray ceaselessly, never stop praying. And um, I remember being with Mother Angelica one time uh, down in, uh, in, in the convent 
and uh, we were walking towards one of the studios, and as we were going down the hallway, the, the door into the chapel was open just a crack, and they have our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament uh, in perpetual exposition uh, over the altar. And uh, there's, so there's perpetual adoration going on in the monastery. And Mother and I were walking down, sort of chatting as we were going down the hallway, and I looked in and did notice the Blessed Sacrament. But as Mother Angelica was walking by the door that was slightly ajar, she looked up to our Lord and just went, <laughs> she blew him a kiss. I mean, it was, you know, it was just so natural. You know, I mean, it, was, uh, it wasn't reflected on. I mean, it was spontaneous. It was natural. I mean, she, she threw a kiss to her bridegroom. I mean, uh, you know, she was a spouse of Christ. It was a beautiful thing. And, uh, and I remember driving her one time, too, and, and we arrived at our destination, and it, ever so softly, I just barely heard it. We pulled up, I, you know, put the car into park, turned the key off, and, and she was, thank you, Jesus. We had arrived safe. I don't know what that was maybe saying about my driving. But <laughs> I just thought of that now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but she prayed without ceasing. I mean, she was, she was always in conversation uh, with God. And the, um, you've all heard that. I'm not going to go off on, on this because it would take too long. But, you know, we, we grow in, in the prayer life. We, we, we go through what they call, the, the spiritual writers call the purgative way, where we purge our, 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 our passions, our interests in this world. And then we enter into what's sometimes called the illuminative way or that of the proficient and then the unitive way, and, and we've all probably been blessed to know people that, that have attained that uh, degree of, of union with God. The, um, <laughs> I don't know, that's, if, okay, if we go to a five after nine? Yeah. I, 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 I'm trying to see, I've, I've got so much here. <laughs> uh, but. But uh, we, we'll cover this rather quickly, but just to, uh, because it's, it, you know, again, this all has to do with love. It all has to do with wishing uh, good for the other, and it doesn't have to do with, with our emotions. And that's basically what I'm going to go on to talk about at this point. The principal objects of our love are God, first of all, this may be surprising, but ourselves, and then our neighbors. Now, the reason after God that we ought to love ourselves is means simply that we would never, ever do anything to jeopardize our relationship with God. I mean, loving ourselves first after loving God means that we will never commit a sin. I mean, we all will, will sin, but we're, we're never going to willfully, uh, knowingly, intentionally go out and sin. That's what it means to love ourselves, because any, any sin is, is, in the deepest sense, an act against ourselves, because we can't hurt God through sinning. We can only hurt ourselves. Okay? So to love ourselves after God means, again, to love God, because it, it means we're not, we won't commit a sin, we won't do anything to harm ourselves, and the only, thing we, the only way we can harm ourselves is, is through sin. That's the only thing that will, that will hurt ourselves, and then, and then our neighbors. But, you know, if, if we're not working on our own holiness and our own perfection uh, in, in our life with God, how can we help others? It's like when you're on an airplane, and they say, uh, you know, uh, when the oxygen masks fall from the, from the, the ceiling above your seats, do they tell you to put the oxygen mask first on your kid's face? Um, what, what do they tell you to do first? Put it on your own face first. <laughs> so Why? So that you can help the kid. You know, so that you'll be, you'll be getting oxygen so that you can look after the child. The same here. If, if we're in a state of sin, how are we going to help anybody else? Yeah. So this is why we, we must always work to maintain ourselves in a state of sin. If you're in a state of sin, get to a priest. I mean, somebody out there might be in a state of mortal sin. I don't know. <laughs> but if you are, please, call them up if it's, if it's before the scheduled time on Saturday. You know, don't waste any time. And you don't want to be like the seamstress with the, 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 the needle and no thread. Right? 
And you want to be able to do good for other people, but you, you can do that only when you're in, in, a, in a relationship of friendship with God. Now, we do know that from an emotional point of view, it's difficult to love everybody equally. Okay? Um, and so we are told, now this, this is going to sound a little hard too, because again, the kind of society that we live in is a radically egalitarian society that says, nobody's better than anybody else. You're not any better than me, right? I mean, uh, I'm as good as anybody else. We, we hear that all the time. It's not true. You know, Mother Teresa was much better than I. <laughs> and I admit it, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go around and say, I'm as good as you, Mother Teresa. No way. I mean, I know better, you know. She's, she's much gooder than I am, you know, and, and I'll admit it, gladly. So, and Catholic theology says that, you've got to understand this right, we, we ought to love more those who are better. In other words, if we see goodness, it just means you love that which is good, is what this means. So, if, if, there's, if there's somebody which, um, uh, somebody who is a, 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 a better person, they're holier, they're more, more filled with, with, with God's life and God's love, yeah, you ought to love that person more. That's okay. Uh, that doesn't mean you're not loving others. It, it just means that you're loving them for the good that they have. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, uh, an act of, of reason. Okay? So again, this concept of merit is, is not alien to our reflection on love. So if we, if we look at another person and see this person is, the two people there, okay? One is loved more than another person. This is this little diagram here. And, and we look at it objectively. That is on the, on the part of the one um, loved. When a greater good is willed to one of those persons rather than another. That's just objective. But now let's turn to the, to the subjective, that is, the one who's doing the loving. And, and here there are two ways in which we can love, appreciatively and intensively. Now, intensively has to do with the emotions. Appreciatively has to do with our judgment with regard to the character, the goodness of the other person. So we can love someone appreciatively that is, we can prefer one to another because we know that one to be a better person, to be gooder, to, to be uh, um, closer to God. But it might be that we don't love that person as intensely as we love the one beside him who maybe isn't as good a person. Okay, that has to do with emotions. I mean, I, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful account last night of, uh, uh, you all know Molly Kelly, or a great deal of you know Molly Kelly, but she, she was uh, reflecting on, uh, her, her husband died when he was, I think, 43, and left her with eight children, eight and under, you know, and, uh, and it wasn't easy raising eight children. And um, it was about a year ago or so, she lost her oldest son, who died in his sleep. Now she lost her husband, in a sledding accident, and then she loses her, her, her oldest son. And she, she was very honest to say that, um, that he was in his 30s, I think he was 39, she said. I might get some of the details wrong here, but it, she's a beautiful illustration of what I'm talking about here. That um, he had, in a sense, he had never fully recovered from his father's death, and uh, she said he was an alcoholic. Um, and was actually in a, in a Catholic halfway house uh, when he died. And well, you can imagine what this did to the heart of a mother. I mean, it just absolutely broke her heart. But you could tell that, there, that he was an alcoholic. He might not have been, quote unquote, as, as, as worthy as her other sons that, that you know, were virtuous and productive. And they, but you, you could see the intensity of the love she had for this son and, and the suffering that he was going through. And she, she told the story of, of, of um, in her mind, taking him in, in her arms because she was worried because he came back late from the job that he had in, in a trolley and 
Philadelphia, and in her mind's eye, she, she carried him and, and uh, placed him in the lap of Mary, the, the Pietà, you know, where Mary holds uh, her son in her lap after his crucifixion. And two weeks later, he, he died. And she said she felt such solace, such peace, that God had granted her this vision in her mind's eye that, that, uh, that it was almost as though God had said, okay, enough's enough, I've got to take him home, you know, and, and he's, he's come home in the, in the arms of Mary. It's, it's, it's an okay thing to say, uh, this individual is, is more worthy of love, that is, uh, it, we ought to love that which is good, it's appreciative, okay, of, of that which is good. We ought to be able to respond by that because that means we're able to make a judgment about what constitutes good character, uh, noble works, and what doesn't. But, this, but we may not necessarily love that person as intensely, you know, as we may love the wayward son. Um, and it's not that the wayward son is worthless by any means. Of course, he has worth as well. But if we're not able to make these kinds of distinctions, this is a very Catholic thing to do, and it's not very easy, it's not very popular, because it's much easier just to say, you know, one person's as good as another. But it isn't the case, we know that. Uh, you can see how rich and how manifold is this divine gift of love, which, is, which has various ways in which it is expressed and manifested in our relationships with others. Okay. So, so that we, we we, we have this, this great love for the saints because, because they are good. Okay? And, um, we, uh, and, and we ought not to feel um, badly if, if we may love more intensely, more emotionally, more subjectively, somebody that doesn't have all the great attributes of character. I mean, that's okay too, you know, uh, because we are human and it's that great love which may help to lead people to their, to their ultimate goal, which is, is the love that, that God himself has, has for each of us. So I just wanted to kind of explain that. that. Those next two sheets, I'll let you read those over yourself, but that's what that's talking about in terms of, of uh, appreciative love and intensive love uh, that we ought to have. So that, I mean, for example, objectively, you know, we ought to love the Blessed Mother, we ought to love the saints, objectively, uh, more than any of our children, for example, b because they're, they're, the Blessed Mother's better than any of my kids. <laughs> she is, you know, better than any of you, <laughs> and she's better than me. Uh, but, th but that doesn't mean that, that we necessarily, that the mother is necessarily going to be loving her more intensely. You see, then she will her, her child or her wayward child. Um, but it's wonderful that we're able to make those, those kinds of distinctions uh, in our reflecting on the kinds of relationship that, uh, that, we, have, uh, that we have with others. Uh, and uh, when it comes to matters of, of charity, and we'll, we'll end with this, and again, <laughs> this is just, I took this out of a, a primer of theology, <coughs> written by a Dominican, and it's, it's very kind of ordered the way Dominicans are. This is on this little chart here on uh, the, uh, the order of charity. And I, I put this in here because people have asked me questions like this. Should I do such and such or should I not do such and such? Where somebody comes to me and asks me for help. And you'll encounter this too with regard to your friends and, and family and neighbors. The... Um, we, we must live a life of charity because charity has been given to us. This great gift of God has been given to us. We are to share it with others. This is what charity is all about. But I, I, uh, I think you know I used to be a Protestant clergyman and uh, I, we had vagabonds or vagrants or street people, whatever you want to call them, coming to the church door all the time, the rectory door all the time. <coughs> And I was certain that, that most of them were taking my money and going off and, and buying alcohol and maybe even drugs. So I, I, I wanted to be able to help these people, but I didn't want to harm them. And I figured, you know, if I give them $5 and they go send it, spend it on alcohol, I haven't really helped them at all. So it's not really an act of charity, is it, you know? So I, I went out and found a, uh, a 
a, a, a sausage stand, hot dog stand, on one of the street corners in, in Chicago, not far from the church, Sammy's Red Hots. And uh, I went to Sammy and I said, uh, what's your top of the line meal here at Sammy's Red Hots? And he said, oh, he said, that'd be a Polish sausage, uh, large fries and a large Coke. And I said, well, what does that come to? And he said, well, that'd be 575. And I said, okay. I said, look, here's my calling card. I'm gonna write on the back of this, good for one meal at Sammy's Red Hots. And I said, if somebody brings you this card, I want you to give them your top of the line meal. And I'll come once a week and I'll collect my cards and I'll give you the money. For the, it's clever, right? I thought, it was, I thought it was pretty good. And I'll, I'll give you the money for the cards that I've collected. I thought, this is a way I can really provide charity to these people and prevent them from harming themselves. And this was going quite well for about three weeks. And, and uh, finally, uh, it was three months actually, finally Sammy says to me one time while I was paying up, he said, should I be giving them change? I said, what are you talking about? And he says, well, they'll come in and, and they'll say, uh, I want a small Coke, but the rest didn't change. And they, they had figured out the value of, of my little calling card, you know. <laughs> Just goes to show, you know, you, you can, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> but uh, so, but, you know, we have an obligation truly to be charitable to other people, but we want to do it in such a way you don't harm them, right? And, and we, we want to be fair with what we share with other people as well. So this, this little chart um, is an attempt to, to help people decide uh, what they ought to give and, and, and the order in which maybe they, they ought to uh, give it to those in need. And you just might find this helpful. I just put it down because I find it helpful. I'll, I'll explain very briefly how it works. If you look at the left-hand column, when our neighbor's need is extreme, and then the second column, and the source of alms are goods, for example, necessary to my life, necessary to my state in life, or superfluous to my state in life, then my obligation to give is, and you read through, so when our neighbor's need is extreme and the source of alms are goods necessary to life, that is my own life, then the obligation to give is none, that is, I, I have an obligation first toward myself for the sake of my, those whom I help, my, my, my children, my wife, my family, and others. And it's interesting, it, unless the needy are public personages, and that's because it's presumed that they are acting for the common good, okay, for, for an even larger family, if you will, than your own. Do you see how that, and that's presuming, of course, that, that public personages are, are not taking graft and are truly, public servants, you know. The, um, when our neighbor's need is extreme and the source of alms or goods necessary to my state in life, then the obligation to give is grave because the neighbor's life is preferable to our own dignity. So if, if, if it's necessary to, if I'm going to keep my, my BMW, uh, but my neighbor's uh, uh, need is, is grave, then I, uh, my neighbor's name is extreme, then I, I should be willing to uh, give up something to my state in life to, to meet uh, the needs of my neighbor. So anyway, you, you can see how that works. You drop down to grave. When our neighbor's need is grave and the source of alms are goods uh, necessary to my state in life, then the obligation to give is grave but without grave hardship to self. It's, as I say, it's just it maybe a helpful little tool when you're uh, trying to figure out how you parcel out the little bit of money you have left after the government takes your taxes and the kids' tuitions are paid. <clears throat> and, the, um, uh, and I'm going to just drop right down here and conclude with sins against charity. Um, it's interesting that there, there are no specific sins against charity, against love, because any sin is against the virtue of love. You know? We, we can talk about specific sins against hope, specific sins against faith, but any sin at all, any turning of our backs on God, any, any rejection of his love, any, um, um, any choice of, of action which is, is going to diminish our own flourishing, if you will, uh, is an act against, against love. And... Um, and when we lose 
this is another teaching, it's, I don't have it here, uh, of the church. But when, when we lose the, 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 the virtue of love, when we lose the, the, uh, uh, the, the grace of God which accompanies uh, his love, um, the, the other virtues are rendered dead. Now, the, the church teaches we don't, for example, we don't lose the virtue of faith and of hope, but they're, they're rendered uh, lifeless in us if, if, we don't, if we don't have love. When we go to the sacrament of reconciliation, we make our confession to God through his priest, receive God's absolution. Remember, the priest is Jesus Christ talking to us. That's why he says, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And only God can forgive sins. But he's speaking, he is Christ speaking to us. We say that the, the, the virtues of faith and hope become revivified. They're, they're filled once again with, with life okay? and are, are, are flourish once more in us. Uh, but when we lose love, as I say, the others, the others are, are, are rendered useless. So that was a real quick overview in, uh, what, five weeks of what I usually take a semester <laughs> to deal with. But I'd, I'd said at the beginning that uh, the purpose of the course was not to help us learn about the virtues, but rather to help us become more virtuous. And, and to exercise the virtues. Uh, that's the point in learning about them. And of course, you know, the, there's no way in which there can be any guarantee of that. But uh, I, I, it's, I mean, teaching is a very selfish thing for me because uh, it, it, it forces me to reflect on these things and to, to carry on my own personal struggle uh, more fervently. Uh, toward the end, but as, as we, we enter into this most holy season of the uh, of the year. I, I hope this has been somewhat helpful for you, that you're able to reflect on some of these uh, virtues and never hesitate to pick up the phone and give a call if uh, you want me to recommend a good confessor. <laughs> and, uh, uh, or if there's anything else that I might be able to do to, uh, to provide a little uh, uh, advice or counsel in, in terms of the, the teachings of the church in the area of the virtues. So thanks for being with us. If any of you have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them, but I don't want to keep anybody late, so uh, uh, feel free to slink off into the night. Okay, so thank you, and God bless you, and have a glorious Easter. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.